for the last 10 or 15 years of his life, Dr. Tertsagi divided his activities between consultation on important engineering projects and teaching at Harvard University. In order to be able to concentrate on these subjects, he taught only in the second semester and gave two courses. One of these was applied soil mechanics and the other was engineering geology. The course on applied soil mechanics dealt with applications of the basic principles that had been taught by Professor Casagrande in his regular classes to such subjects as anchored bulkheads, tunnels, pressures against open cuts, and various kinds of foundation problems. The course in engineering geology was one in which he was particularly interested. He approached the subject from a different point of view each year. It was his intention when he finally organized the material to his satisfaction that the notes for the course would constitute the beginning of a textbook on engineering geology. Part of the course was based on standard geological textbooks and was really a review of the principles of physical geology with particular attention to the engineering consequences of the various geological processes. But a large portion of the course dealt with projects, particularly dams and tunnels, where the variations in natural soil deposits, the differences in properties from one place to another, and the surprises that might be in store for the engineer received his attention. As it turned out, Dr. Tertsagi was never completely satisfied with the organization of the course, and he never completed a textbook on engineering geology. On many instances, various of his friends asked him to make recordings of his lectures, and this he rather consistently declined to do because he felt that his lectures might not be perfection. He felt that his command of the English language was perhaps inadequate, although, as a matter of fact, his knowledge of English and his use of the language was extremely good. But finally, in one of the last times that he gave the course, Professor Arthur Casagrande persuaded him that it would be of great interest to posterity to be able to hear his voice and to hear him express his most important ideas and philosophy of engineering geology and of civil engineering practice. So he consented to record the first lecture of the engineering geology course the last time he presented it at Harvard University. The lecture that follows is that recording delivered to a large class of students and is an introduction to the detailed studies that these students could expect to be working on during the following semester. For the first time after many years that I appear in uh, this uh, cozy uh, room in the Carpathian guest speaker and uh, not of a regular performer uh, whose uh, duty it is to stuff the mental food down the throat of his victims whether they like it or not. As a course in engineering geology, uh, which uh, starts uh, today, 
formed uh, part of your training in the very essential part uh, in the broader field of uh, earthwork uh, engineering. In order to realize the function of engineering geology in earthwork engineering, uh, it is useful uh, to go back uh, to its origins. Uh, those engineers uh, who started their professional career uh, some 20 or 25 years ago uh, may have the impression uh, that engineering geology uh, represents the latest development uh, in the field of uh, soil mechanics. Uh, in reality, that's the opposite is true. Uh, because soil mechanics, uh, because engineering geology uh, preceded soil mechanics by more than one century. Uh, you can learn uh, this fact by opening any one uh, of the textbooks on foundation engineering or on earthwork engineering in general, uh, which has been published uh, prior to about 1920. Uh, there you will find that the subsurface material has been divided into several categories, into fine sand, coarse sand, silt, stiff and soft clay, weathered rock, and sound rock, and the like. And to each one of these categories was assigned a simple empirical relationship or rule or design. Foremost among these rules were the tables for allowable soil pressure, the rules for selecting the slopes on fields, the procedure uh, for uh, designing uh, the support in tunnels and the like. Theoretical procedures uh, for uh, design did not exist, with two exceptions. One of these exceptions was the theory of uh, earth pressure, and the other one, the theory of the distribution of uh, stresses and uh, loaded area. The theory of earth pressure has originated about 1780. It was published by Coulomb. Uh, yet, it was 100 years till after the publication of Coulomb's paper that the most prominent and experienced uh, engineer, uh, Mr. Benjamin Baker, rejected quite emphatically the use of this theory in connection with practical problems uh, in a paper which is now uh, considered as a classic. It was read before the institution of uh, civil engineers in London. And as far as business theory is concerned, uh, which originated in 1880, that theory was not used at all by any engineer for the simple reason because at the state of knowledge between 1880 and about 1920, nobody could have done anything with it. In the consequence, up to about 1920, uh, practically all the city and all designs in the field of earthwork engineering were based on engineering geology. And uh, the geologists they are very fully aware of this fact. It has been expressed uh, by a 19th century uh, geologist, the geologist uh, who uh, made the preliminary investigation for the St. Gotthard tunnel in Switzerland. Uh, he expressed uh, the fact in the following words. He said, every civil engineer is engaged in experimental geology without being conscious of this fact and without being spoiled by the recognition of the benefits uh, which the science of geology has derived from these activities. On account of the prominent role of engineering uh, in the design of earth structures and of, uh, in the decisions concerning large excavations, Every important project 
uh, was started with a thorough geological survey. And uh, the publications of the results of this survey are still today a very valuable source of information. I wish to quote a few and other publications of stuff concerning the geology at the site of the St. Cotard Tunnel, which was built about 1872 to 1880. The geological investigations of the site of the St. John Tunnel in Switzerland and then of the Kaiser Wilhelm uh, Canal in Germany, which was open for traffic about in uh, 1890. Furthermore, the first geological map was prepared and published by civil engineer uh, William Smith in 1815 and not by geology. And the first textbook on engineering geology was published as early as 1875. And in 1905, when I started in my professional career, uh, the uh, training of every student uh, in civil engineering included a course in Georgia. And as far as I'm concerned, when I uh, entered practice, I knew very much more about uh, this subject than most of my colleagues, uh, because Georgia was from my very early age, my hobby. Yet as soon as I was confronted with practical problems, I realized that the benefit to be derived from a geology which I knew and which I was taught are largely imaginary. I entered the services of the uh, contractor and in rapid succession, I experienced one major failure after another. First of all, the failure of the foundation of a, a large factory building near Vienna. Then came a, a huge uh, landslide which uh, descended into our foundation pit for a construction of a concrete gravity dam in Transylvania. Then the failure of a pressure tunnel on the same project. Then the failure of a dam by piping in the eastern side. Nobody was blamed, and uh, these accidents had even an official name. They are called Acts of God. Uh, that is the uh, name which was always uh, used during the lawsuit uh, which followed the incident. And uh, the, uh, the blame was non-existent, but uh, at the same time, the incidents were embarrassing and caused this for everybody concerned. From uh, these experiences, I concluded erroneously that this mishap could be avoided by refinement in the method of geological uh, site investigation. And I decided to concentrate on engineering geology. In 1911, uh, I gave up a lucrative uh, job as chief engineer of a contracting uh, firm in Europe and went to the United States uh, with the intention to study the performance of soil and rock at the dam site of the uh, U.S. Uh, reclamation service, which at that time was engaged in the construction of a great number of irrigation dams uh, in the western United States, and to analyze the observed performance in the light of engineering geology. Before I embarked on uh, that venture, I called Mr. F. H. Newell in uh, Washington, D.C., who was at that time the director of the reclamation service, and since he shared my illusion, he gave me wholehearted support. The result of uh, two years of hard labor in a field, they are so disappointing that I did not even care to publish any of the results of my observations. But at the same time, I realized, and for the first time really, uh, the crucial deficiency of engineering geology. This deficiency 
resides in the fact that every one of the terms which you find in the geological report applies to materials with widely different engineering properties. For instance, a sand is designated in this report on the basis of prevalent drain size. This sand can be loose or dense, highly permeable or slightly permeable. And these properties, which are of paramount and important from an engineering point of view, are not mentioned at all. Or, a uh, clay uh, was classified on the basis of its consistency. Uh, yet, nobody knew about the fact that the clay can be sensitive or insensitive, which makes a world of a difference, and the terms which were used uh, by uh, for uh, designating consistency were so vague uh, that they left a wide margin for interpretation. The influence of uh, uh, humidity or water on the stability of slope was ascribed to the lubricating action uh, of the water. But as soon as I started experimenting at that time, I found out that this lubricating effect uh, does not exist. As a matter of fact, a certain quantity of water added to a same even increases its steering resistance instead of reducing it. Furthermore, uh, COVID soils, uh, such as clay, contain always, and under any circumstances, uh, below uh, a depth of a few feet below the surface, uh, water to such an extent that their whites are completely filled, uh, so that uh, a distinction between the lubricated and non-lubricated uh, state cannot be made. On the other hand, I found out that the steering resistance of fires depends to a large extent on the pore water pressure or on the pressure which uh, acts in the uh, water contained in the white of the soil, and the concept of pore water pressure uh, did not exist, and the consequence nobody suspected uh, that uh, this factor could have an important influence. Therefore, it became obvious that the conventional engineering geology uh, had already reached the limit of its usefulness uh, in about 1900, and that further progress called for procedures for expressing the engineering properties of geological materials by numerical value. I thought that this would be an easy method. I started my investigation in 1917 in Istanbul, and I believe that I could complete them uh, within about uh, two years, where I could return with three functions into engineering practice. In reality, I had to spend seven years of hard uh, labor on uh, that task in the primitive laboratory and with a very uh, limited amount of library facilities uh, at my disposal. In 1925, I published uh, my findings in a book, Soil Mechanics. Uh, that is the time when the word Soil Mechanics uh, came into existence. After the publication of that book, I was invited to lecture on the topic uh, of the book at MIT. That gave me an opportunity to uh, uh, reach a broader audience and uh, to practice the principles of time mechanics under very diversified uh, geologic conditions. Uh, since time mechanics satisfied the need which was felt by practically every engineer engaged uh, in earthwork engineering, uh, the um, habit of uh, uh, studying soil mechanics uh, spread within a decade uh, all over the United States. Uh, first came the uh, Bureau of uh, Public Roads. Uh, shortly after my arrival uh, in the state, uh, I was requested by the Bureau to uh, join them in the capacity of a consultant, and I continued uh, this capacity until uh, 1929. 
uh, Nick uh, team, the uh, U.S. Army engineers, and the stimulative influence uh, of uh, Professor A. Uh, Salva Grande, uh, who started his teaching activities about in 1929, and finally came the U.S. Uh, Bureau of uh, Reclamation. After the International uh, Conference on Soil Mechanics and Foundation Engineering in 1936 uh, in Cambridge, uh, similar movements and development uh, started on uh, all the other continents as well. On account of the great variety of practical applications of soil mechanics, it became necessary uh, to develop new techniques uh, for subsoil exploration and testing. Foremost among them uh, were the procedures for securing undisturbed uh, samples, the techniques of penetration test in drill holes, and uh, the development of uh, uh, tools and means for measuring pore water pressure uh, in the subsoil. The use of the uh, advanced techniques uh, soon disclosed the fact uh, that uh, the occurrence of a homogeneous strata of great thickness and extent is extremely rare, much rarer than I suspected at the outset. And if the pattern of uh, a uh, body of soil is erratic, the results of the boring and uh, of soil test leave a wide margin for interpretation, uh, even in the event that the holes are closely spaced. The results of boring and of test uh, can be intelligently correlated and used for the construction of geological and soil profiles only by geological means and on the basis of geological reasoning. On account of this fact, our interest did turn to geology, but this time on a very much uh, higher plane. In order to uh, illustrate the benefit, uh, which uh, uh, can be derived from engineering geology at the present state of our knowledge, I will tell you the following uh, example. Uh, it was in uh, 1943. Uh, one of the large uh, lumber companies in Canada uh, decided to put up a pulp and uh, uh, paper mill on the west coast of uh, Vancouver Island. The site was located near the uh, north tip uh, of a low peninsula on the south shore of a narrow estuary. And the project called for severing uh, the site with a layer of fill in a thickness of about uh, 10 feet. The borings were made to a depth of 80 feet and uh, they showed that the subsoil to the depth uh, consists of silt, fine silty stain, and the increase in depth, the material becomes coarser and coarser, and finally, uh, the depth of about uh, 70 feet, uh, they have reached a uh, coarse and dense stain. Uh, therefore, uh, they intended to establish their factory on point bearing piles, which are driven to the top, uh, top strata uh, into the layer of uh, firm uh, sand. Uh, before construction was started, I was called to comment on the project. On the basis of my knowledge of the geology of that region and of its uh, geological history, I concluded uh, that the sand rests most likely at a depth of about uh, 100 feet on a thick stratum of highly compressible clay and that the presence of this stratum uh, would cause an equal settlement uh, up to about two feet, which for a pulp and uh, paper mill uh, is intolerable. Uh, boring, which were made after I submitted my report, actually disclosed the presence of uh, this stratum at a depth of about 95 feet, and uh, its thickness uh, exceeded 40 feet. On the account of the findings, it was necessary in the last moment 
all his uh, details plans are already prepared to fix the site to the root of the peninsula uh, over a distance of about uh, 2,000 feet where that lower place stratum uh, was absent. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, the knowledge of the existence of the stratum of place at the depth of 100 feet would have been virtual uh, because no engineer uh, would have expected that the presence of the stratum at that depth could conceivably have a significant influence on the performance of the structure resting uh, on the surface. However, today, uh, we not only are aware of the practical consequences of geological facts like the presence of this stratum, that we are even in a position uh, to uh, express the effect of uh, such strata uh, on the performance of the factory in very things. This example uh, illustrates the difference between the benefits uh, to be derived from engineering geology in 1900 and at the present uh, day. The type of information uh, furnished by the geology has not changed. So this usefulness has vastly increased because engineers have developed the means for eliminating the uncertainties associated with geological terms and they have learned to predict the performance of the material uh, of the earth on the basis of the laws of the mechanics of solids and of hydraulics. In my own practice, which uh, uh, covers now half a century and uh, four continents, I uh, have never encountered a uh, major engineering problem uh, which could be solved either by geology or by solid mechanics uh, alone. Uh, the solution always uh, requires both uh, domains of knowledge. The course of engineering geology, uh, which I have laid out uh, during the last uh, decade, uh, consists of two parts. Uh, the first part uh, deals with the elements of physical geology. It is covered by some standard textbooks on physical geology and supplemented uh, by a demonstration of the most important uh, rock and rock forming minerals. Uh, in the Department uh, of Geology. Uh, the lectures uh, really uh, serve to uh, call your attention to those aspects of uh, general uh, geology which uh, are of outstanding engineering importance. Uh, these lectures, some of them will be uh, given by Mr. Ferris and uh, some of them uh, by my wife who has uh, learned engineering geology uh, the hard way in the field on three continents and under the intensive guidance of her husband. The second part uh, deals with the influence of geological factors on engineering operations uh, such uh, as uh, subsoil exploration and uh, tunneling. The principal object of the course is to open uh, your eyes to the influence of the geological factors on engineering operations in general and to the benefits to be derived from uh, geological reasoning. If you succeed in grasping the importance of the system, uh, your interest and competence in engineering uh, geology will steadily increase that you, because your course will have given to you a permanent and very uh, powerful incentive for observation in the field. But if you don't succeed, uh, you need better uh, keep away uh, from earthquake engineering uh, because most failures uh, in the field are due to ignoring uh, the consequences of geological factors and not to errors in computation.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Time flies like an arrow, and it is now already the last day of the ninth international conference on soil mechanics and foundation engineering in Tokyo. It is indeed one of the major highlights of the Tokyo conference to be able to hear Dr. Peck talk about his long and intimate associations with the great masters of modern soil mechanics and foundation engineering. Because Dr. Peck himself is one of them, the special lecture this morning is inevitably limited to the nets of four presents 1936 to 1969. But I'm sure everyone in this hall would also like to hear someday the fascinating vignette of this great master of our profession. Since everybody present here knows this very special lecturer well enough, there seems to be no need to introduce Dr. Peck in detail. In fact, should there be anybody who does not recognize the name of Ralph B. Peck, in the world of soil mechanics and foundation engineering, he would most certainly be disqualified as a geotechnical engineer because it does indicate he has never read the Bible of a profession, soil mechanics in engineering practice, which is almost universally referred to affectionately as Peltzagi and Peck. Although the days are gone when the University of Illinois and Professor Peck were synonymous terms, the penetrating imprint he has left on the many students all over the world is now vigorously contributing to the science and art of geotechnical engineering. It is indeed fortunate that he is still very active as one of the most renowned consultants in the world. On the behalf of Organizing Committee for Tokyo Conference, I express sincerely the delight and gratitude for having been able to invite Dr. Peck as our special lecturer this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our distinguished former president of the International Society, Professor Peck. Thank you, Ted. Between 1936 and 1969, our society had four remarkable presidents. They are well known for their technical contributions, for each of them has left a legacy of outstanding papers and engineering works. Not so well known, especially as time goes by, are the personalities behind the contributions. It has been my good fortune to know each of them well, some better than others, but all to the degree that we have had warm personal relations. In this talk, I shall try to give you glimpses of the men themselves. The glimpses are by no means biographies. They are no more than impressions, but perhaps will give life to the technical contributions. I have no illusions that these comments will give a well-rounded picture of any of these remarkable men, nor do I make any apology that the impressions are my own, that they have arisen out of my personal contacts, and that they are necessarily limited by the circumstances of our relationships. Yet I hope that these brief sketches will help you feel better acquainted with the men who presided over our society for its first 33 years and thus with the beginnings of our profession. The first, of course, is Karl Terzaghi. Our first president and the founder of our profession is no stranger to any of us because he wrote extensively of the development of his own understanding of soil mechanics and especially in his presidential addresses of his evaluation of the state of the art. Others, too, have not only written of his technical accomplishments, 
but have recounted many anecdotes that illuminate his personality. Hence, the length of these remarks about Terzaghi is by no means proportional to his overwhelming importance, for I do not wish to repeat what you already know. From 1942 to 1948, Terzaghi and I worked intensively on soil mechanics and engineering practice. Somewhat to our surprise, the writing did not go well. It is enough to say that even to Terzaghi, the book presented for the first time the necessity for a critical evaluation of the relevance of each facet of soil mechanics to practice. Moreover, gaps appeared where soil mechanics was inadequate to cope with some of the most commonplace problems, and if possible, these gaps had to be filled. Yet this was not his first book. Erdbaum Mechanic and Theoretical Soil Mechanics had already appeared and had been remarkably influential. How did Terzaghi regard them? As to Erdbaum Mechanic, I vividly recall one incident while Terzaghi was visiting at the University of Illinois. He wished to refer to some information he had included in the book. But after thumbing through the pages and fruitlessly consulting the index, he exploded in frustration. When I wrote that book, he exclaimed, I thought I was doing my duty if I merely laid out the bill of fare. It was up to the reader, poor devil, to grub through it to find what nourishment he could. Even the index is no good. Not even I can find anything. Theoretical soil mechanics was quite a different matter. It cost him several years of intense concentration and is still a model of clarity in organization. Indeed, it was so well done that much to his dismay, it gave to many engineers and academicians the impressions that soil mechanics is primarily a theoretical subject, an idea the very opposite of his own convictions. Why then did he write such a book? It was his overwhelming interest and purpose to write a book for the practitioner, a book on applied soil mechanics. He feared, however, that introducing the necessary theory into the discussions would divert the reader's attention from the main thrust of his approach. So he decided to precede the applied book by one containing all the necessary theory to which he could then refer. In spite of his full realization that he was not a theorist, he admired elegance in theory and regarded his own efforts as clumsy. He nevertheless felt the responsibility to take upon himself the task of examining the available stock of theories, of evaluating their assumptions, and of making the judgments concerning their utility and shortcomings for practice. He did the job remarkably well. Moreover, the companion volume on applied soil mechanics never appeared. The section on applied soil mechanics in soil mechanics and engineering practice in effect took its place. Yet, because theoretical soil mechanics is complete within itself, many engineers have been led to the false impression that theory is the essence of soil mechanics. Terzaghi considered the extract of theory in the second part of, th of soil mechanics and engineering practice to be ample for most practitioners, and the continued sale of theoretical soil mechanics at a volume comparable to that of theoretical soil mechanics was a source of concern rather than a satisfaction to him. Unfortunately, the reader of theoretical soil mechanics would never get even the slightest hint that Terzaghi's avocation and hobby were geology, or that he considered soil mechanics to be a quantified aspect of applied or engineering geology. Yet, in his lectures to students, and in his consideration of individual jobs, his emphasis was always on the manner in which nature had created the deposit, on what variations in properties might be expected as a consequence of the natural events during and after deposition, and on what the physical properties of the geologically differentiable parts of the deposit might be. Boring programs and soil tests were always laid out to illuminate the geology, his interpretations 
and interpolation of the findings always had a geological background. Until he understood in detail the geology of a site, he had little confidence in predictions based on tests, theories, or statistical analyses. He would have taken a dim view of today's trend to decrease the time a civil engineering student devotes to geology in order to add corresponding studies of computer science. Tritsagi's almost instinctive use of geology appeared in the first major consulting job we shared after our work on the Chicago subway, the iron ore storage yard at Cleveland, Ohio. You may recall his final report on this project, reprinted in the Tritsagi anniversary volume. It happened that I was the first to visit the job. The immediate questions were the length and bearing capacity of the piles beneath the retaining walls that would enclose the iron ore to be stockpiled along the riverfront. As I watched the test boring operations and estimated the undrained strength of the clay samples being recovered from the subsoil, I concluded that a base failure of the ore stockpile involving the retaining wall piles as well was almost certain. Indeed, on the basis of my estimate of strength, the factor of safety was no more than 0.7. When the officials of the steel company asked me what could be done about the prophesied failure, I had no answer except to suggest that they call Tritsagi. They did, without telling him that they had already asked my advice, and on his arrival explained exactly as they had to me their concern about the retaining wall piles. He also watched the test boring in progress, and like myself, made a quick mental calculation of the bearing capacity of the storage area. His calculation, like mine, indicated failure. But he noticed one feature I had overlooked. The ore yard was to be located in a valley surrounded by steep banks in sand extending to an upland over a hundred feet above the valley, whereas the ore pile was only to be seventy feet high. The valley fill a fluvial glacial deposit, must once have extended across the entire valley and subsequently have been eroded by the ancestor of the stream now flowing in the ore storage area. Hence the glacial lacustrine clays underlying the valley must have been overconsolidated and quite likely had a greater strength than suggested by the disturbed drive samples. Furthermore, Tritsagi also noticed that there was no sign of failure beneath or in front of the toes of the steep sand bluffs, even though the geology clearly indicated that the lacustrine clays extended beneath the toes. These favorable indications prompted Tertsagi to judge that the chances were actually quite good that the ore pile would be stable, and that an observational procedure would have a good chance of success. The final report, to which I have referred, shows that his optimism was justified. It would be misleading not to complete this sketch without recalling the many discussions after dinner when we'd spent the day over a manuscript or in the field on one of our jobs and when Tertsagi inevitably turned to the future of soil mechanics. He feared for it because he feared it might depart from reality. He feared the consequences of theory for its own sake, of soil tests as an exercise in increasingly sophisticated laboratory expertise, of routine calculations as a substitute for the implications of geology. Above all, he feared that workers in soil mechanics would take for granted that nature would behave in accordance with their predictions and that they would fail to take every opportunity to determine how nature had actually reacted to their designs and construction activities. Now, may we have the lights out for a moment for a few slides. In the first photograph, which was sent to me by Professor Chebateryoff, we see Tertsagi in a typical pose on the tour from Zurich to Lausanne at the Swiss Conference in 1953. And in the next slide, we see him again in a typical attitude, 
In the evening, on the shore of Lake Maracaibo in Venezuela, after a day studying the subsidence caused by the extraction of oil. In the next one, on the same day, returning in a launch to the hotel from the airfields, uh, from the oil fields crossing Lake Maracaibo. It wasn't quite that dark that day. The next one is not a very good photograph, but it was taken during a dinner at the job site of Mission Dam, which you will recall was renamed Tertsagi Dam at the Montreal meeting in British Columbia on Tertsagi's 75th birthday in 1957. And finally, the next slide, with his wife, Ruth, after driving me to the Boston airport in 1960. Tritsagi was 78 at this time. This was just before the series of mishaps that led to his final illness. The lights, please. A.W. Skempton. Skempton as you observed for yourself last Wednesday, is physically a big man. Indeed, everything about him is big. His smile, his laugh, his voice, his gestures. He even writes with a broad pen. From the first time I met him, I was struck by his tremendous enthusiasm. Whatever he did, whatever he discussed, was pervaded with an air of intense excitement. He never described large objects as merely large, they were enormous. Indeed, he added the word enormous to my own working vocabulary. I use it often and never without thinking of him. In our field, we regard him as the great clarifier of the principles of soil mechanics. He is the man who gave life to the principle of effective stress. From his first approach, with the lambda theory at Rotterdam to his concept of the semi-empirical pore pressure coefficients. The understanding gained from the introduction of the A and B coefficients was a great step forward, almost as important as Tertsagi's statement of the principle of effective stress itself. He painted in soil mechanics with a broad brush, seeing such simplifying and useful relations as the ratio between compression index and liquid limit visualizing the significance of the residual angle of internal friction. Yet Skempton is equally at home and respected in history, particularly of engineering and architecture and in geology. Indeed, it was perhaps through his interest in the history of architecture that he and I personally became best acquainted. In 1954, he came to the University of Illinois to deliver a set of lectures on shear strength. As you would expect, they were masterful lectures, and I still keep my notes as treasured possessions. During the same visit, he talked to the members of the local section of the American Society of Civil Engineers and their wives on the structural development of the medieval cathedral. The talk is still remembered by wives who had not before realized that an engineer could be so entertaining, and yet they realized afterwards so technical. But Skempton's real interest in that first visit was the old buildings of Chicago. He had long been intrigued with the transition from masonry structures to the modern framed building. Part of the development had occurred in England and in the rest of Europe, but some of the more significant advances were made in Chicago in the late 1800s. Several famous old buildings were still standing. Others had recently been destroyed. Skempton was keen to see the survivors before it was too late. The history of old buildings in Chicago, and especially their foundations, had been one of my own interests as well. Accordingly, we arranged for an inspection of as many buildings as time would permit. In the company of Sidney Berman, who was then in charge of soil mechanics for the Chicago subway, and who had a genius for enlisting the cooperation, perhaps unwitting, of custodians and security guards, we dashed in and out of the basements, stairwells, and elevator shafts of many an old structure, some almost ruins. There were too many buildings to see and too much to absorb, 
and Skempton began to despair of accomplishing more than scratching the surface of information he greatly wanted. The solution to that dilemma, of course, was for him to return on several occasions to Illinois. Architects and engineers also had appreciated the significance of the old buildings and had set up a project to microfilm whatever plans were still on file in the offices of long-standing architectural firms. One set of these microfilms, containing thousands of drawings, was filed at the university. On Skempton's next trip, he was to review them. I borrowed a microfilm reader and installed it in his bedroom at our home so that he could make the most of his time. <laughs> My recollection of that trip is of almost none of our accustomed conversations, but instead of the view of the back of Skempton's head under the microfilm reader, while he peered hour by hour at the detailed drawings of the old buildings. He simply had to see them all. His total immersion in the subject, his disappearance into the microfilm reader, were completely characteristic of his enthusiasm for whatever subject he attacked. I first visited England in 1953 on my return from the Swiss Conference. Skempton took me in complete charge. I had only about three days, and he was determined that I should make the most of them. Well do I remember the first evening in Skempton's living room with him and Silas Grossop, another tremendously enthusiastic man and another of the early group of farm mechanics personalities in Great Britain. I was virtually ignored in the conversation, while these two debated hotly and with great relish the places to which I must go and the things I must see. It was long after midnight when we went to bed. We would go to Land's End in Cornwall, where I would see the birthplace of the steam locomotive and Trefethen's Mine Railroad. Moreover, we would have to be on our way no later than six o'clock the next morning. Along about two o'clock in the morning, Skempton knocked on my door and said rather apologetically that he had been thinking over the situation and realized that he and Silas had proposed a much more strenuous agenda than could be carried out. And furthermore, that on a first visit to England, there was much to be seen close to London. Perhaps it would be better to take things a little easier, to see Stonehenge, the Salisbury Plain, Salisbury Cathedral, one of Skempton's favorite, of which his knowledge was intimate. The picture often returns to my mind of Skempton standing before the fireplace, scotch and soda in hand, debating fiercely with gossip the priorities of my introduction into England, ranging in sparkling debate over the technical history of England's cathedrals and industry, while I, although present, was only the passive object of their attention. Lest you gain the wrong impression, I was utterly fascinated. Now, the slides again, please. Here we see him with uh, the back of Professor Chebateryov's head at one of the interludes in the Swiss conference. In the next slide, at a picnic lunch, both of us obviously a fair bit younger, on the way to see the famous landslide between Folkestone and Dover, still in 1953. And the next one with his wife, Nancy, in their backyard in London that year. The next one is also with Nancy, this time at Abraham Lincoln's home as a young man in New Salem, Illinois, the picture in 1954. And I remember particularly Nancy's comment looking at the stark life that people must have experienced in the Middle West in these surroundings at the time of Abraham Lincoln's youth that this was the time of Victoria and Albert in England. It hardly seemed possible that people over in the state could be living under such primitive conditions. And the last slide, taken a year later, with Nancy and with my wife in our backyard in Urbana. Right, please. Arthur Casagrande. I met our third president first under what might have been quite unfavorable circumstances. 
I had determined for personal reasons that I wished to study soil mechanics under Arthur Casagrande and wrote him accordingly. Unfortunately, my decision was made shortly after the beginning of the second semester of his regular courses. He wrote me politely that it would be a great handicap to enter his group when it had already completed more than half of its curriculum, and he recommended that I wait until the following fall. Since I was not in a position to do this, to follow his advice, I wrote that I was coming nonetheless and would take my chances. When I arrived and called at his office, he greeted me most graciously, made every effort to see that Mrs. Peck and I were comfortably settled in Cambridge, and never alluded to the inconvenience that my unseasonable arrival must have caused him. This was my introduction to the graciousness, personal interest, and genuine concern that all his students would agree are hallmarks of his personality. Arthur Casagrande has said that his interest in order of their importance are research, teaching, and practice. <clears throat> Yet, although he has certainly excelled in all three, in my own view, he really placed teaching first, followed by practice, and finally by research. As his students, we came to regard him as the great teacher, always thoroughly prepared, not dramatic, but completely at home in every detail, he developed among us a sense of being in the mainstream of soil mechanics. We felt as if we occupied ringside seats in every round of the development and growth of soil mechanics from its beginnings. Casagrande's relations with Tertsagi were close, but often complex and even delicate. During the early days of World War II, while I was a student of Casagrande, he and A. E. Cummings of Chicago together made the necessary guarantees to permit Tertagi to immigrate to the United States. Tertagi was installed in an office at Harvard, first as a lecturer and subsequently as professor of the practice of civil engineering. Although Casagrande had developed the entire program at Harvard during Tertagi's nine-year absence from the country, Tertagi considered it perfectly natural to regard himself as the master in a master-disciple relationship. Moreover, Kurtzaghi disdained most academic duties other than his lectures. Casagrande, often at considerable expenditure of time, fulfilled Kurtzaghi's obligations as well as his own. Although Casagrande felt the greatest respect and devotion for Kurtzaghi, surely Kurtzaghi was something of a trial and tribulation to him. I can speak from personal experience. Because Tertsagi, although he rarely spent more than a week at a time with me, either on the Chicago subway or at the University of Illinois, left me exhausted and often more than a little irritated over his requirements. His, contract with, his contacts with Casagrande were not limited to a week. It was Casagrande who proposed the first international conference of 1936, and Tertsagi who considered it too great a gamble at such an early stage in soil mechanics. Casagrande proceeded nonetheless and created the conference that established soil mechanics as a legitimate and essential part of civil engineering. Tertagi soon admitted that he had evaluated the situation incorrectly and relished his position as president of the conference and of the International Society. Casagrande's enthusiasm for soil mechanics does not take the form of dramatic performances. Indeed, for his presidential address at the Fourth International Conference, he chose to discuss classification and information retrieval systems for soil mechanics literature. I am sure he knew the limitations of this subject as the basis for an inspirational address. Yet because of its importance in soil mechanics, he felt it was his duty. Without the stimulus of that address, I doubt that we would have our excellent abstract and retrieval system today. On the job, as a consultant on a major dam, for example, Arthur Casagrande can only be described as an artist. He gives the greatest care to the selection of the materials to be placed in the dam. For him, it is not enough that the calculated factor of safety should have an accepted value. He works toward the best dam that can be constructed with an economic limit. 
and insist on including every reasonable detail that can improve performance, even if the results of the details are difficult to quantify. Where possible, for instance, he insists that the dam be curved upstream, and that the inclinations of the abutments be favorable with respect to resisting downstream movements, even if the axis has to be readjusted or relocated when the abutments have been stripped. He refuses to debate the influence of these refinements on the value of the factor of safety. He simply points out that they produce a better dam. No one has a keener sense of the inadequacies of the design procedures to take into account all the ways water may act to endanger man's structures. No one either is more aware of the significance of the properties of real soils. When the Corps of Engineers asked him to train large numbers of their officers in the construction of military airfields during World War II, he realized that these men would have to make their decisions and carry out their work largely without the benefit of laboratories. He collected a great variety of soils and hour after hour sat in the midst of a group of his trainees, fingering and examining the soils, describing and discussing their characteristics, developing the ability to estimate numerical values of the physical properties by manual and visual observation and the simplest of tests, and pointing out how the soils would perform during and after construction under differing field conditions. Thus he demonstrated how much can be deduced from literally getting one hand, one's hands dirty. Yet at the other end of the spectrum, he decried engineers who accepted the, the sophisticated test results of others if they themselves had not performed many such tests and if they did not know from their personal experience the influence of disturbance and poor laboratory techniques on the soil property. For Arthur Casagrande, in soil mechanics, the emphasis is on the soil. Last year, Arthur Casagrande and I served with seven other engineers on the independent panel to review the cause of failure of Teton Dam. At the time of our final meeting, when the deadline for completing our report was upon us, we were still struggling with one issue, how much emphasis to place on the results of calculations showing the theoretical possibility of hydraulic fracturing of the core material at the base of the key trench. There was no disagreement that the results of the calculations carried out by finite element analyses should be presented. Taken at face value, they indicated the likelihood of fracturing. Yet many assumptions were involved in the calculations, and no clear scientific demonstration of the mechanism of the phenomenon under conditions corresponding to those prevailing during reservoir filling was available. The chairman of the panel appointed a subcommittee consisting of five members to develop acceptable wording. The debate Though Ernest was vigorous, at times more realistically described as a shouting match. At the height of the tumultuous session, one of the other panelists paused at the meeting room, listened briefly, and beat a hasty retreat. Next morning, when we presented our agreed-upon wording, he commented, What other professor could you imagine with whom four former students could express themselves so freely and forcefully with no holds barred? We realized that by coincidence, all four of us had indeed been Casagrande's students at various times many years ago, but in the debate, he was one of us. Then, as always, he presumed no master-disciple relationship. It is not his nature to demand respect. Instead, he earns affection. On the job, after dinner, when consultants and the people on the job gather for fellowship, Arthur becomes the center of attention as he draws on his great store of anecdotes. He has a remarkable memory for enlightening or amusing incidents, many recalling the early days of soil mechanics, and he recounts them with great skill and relish. Even meetings of consulting boards are enlivened, and sometimes a tense moment broken by one of his always pertinent anecdotes. Once again, the slides, please. The first three of these slides are all in the same job. The first shows Arthur in a backhoe trench 
in glacial till being considered as core material for mica dam in British Columbia 15 years ago in 1962. He examined these materials in the greatest detail. His favorite examining tool is a screwdriver, which he always borrows from somebody, never brings his own, and with which he can make a remarkable number of conclusions about the relative density, characteristics, and fabric of the material. The next slide shows him with his nephew, who happens to be a soil engineer on that job, at the same time. And the next slide, ten years later, still at Micah Dam with a group of the engineers. This is at a time when the dam was well advanced in construction. And finally, the next slide, just this last fall, inspecting the contact between the core and the rock in the key trench during the investigation of the failure of Teton Dam. Our fourth president, Lars Bjerum, had much in common with Skempton, with whom he had a close personal bond. Perhaps he painted with a less broad brush and with greater pursuit of detail, but with no less enthusiasm. Full of life and vigor, he lived intensely, worked intensely, and took the greatest joy in his work his family, and his friends. There were no halfway measures for him. He lived and worked with death. He was a superb selector and organizer of talent, with the ability to generate support for and from his colleagues. NGI quickly became not only a great research organization, but the world-recognized finishing school of soil mechanics. Yet for all its technical achievements, and its attraction for foreign scholars, its people were always Garam's family. He was also a great showman with a keen sense of the dramatic. What to many would have been a dull technical subject became a mystery, a compelling detective story in his hands. Long will he be remembered for his part in the first ASCE specialty conference in soil mechanics usually referred to as the Boulder Shear Conference in 1960. The now familiar format of the Boulder Conference was an experiment. Panel sessions on selected topics with a moderator and with participants consisting of the big names. The first several sessions were rather formal. Each panelist gave a short, prepared speech. Later, the panelists debated politely among themselves. The sessions were informal and interesting, but hardly exciting. I was the moderator of one of the last sessions, and our panel decided to encourage some spontaneity. I proposed that the panel discuss informally a specific problem. How to estimate the shear strength of an existing slope on which an embankment is suddenly built. Stanley Wilson volunteered to start the discussion and he had barely stated what soil test he would perform when Bjorn jumped from his seat, commandeered the microphone, and exclaimed, I disagree. Not only was the audience startled, so was Stan, so was I. There followed a lively debate, unrehearsed and unanticipated, that delighted the audience and that pinpointed better than any sober technical discussion the real issues, the shortcomings of our knowledge. Typically, Bjorn not only played the game, he made the rules and sparked the competition. The audience truly saw what they had come for, the big names in action. Jerem's acquaintance with Pitsagi began later than that of Skempton, Castagrandi, or myself. Yet their relation was remarkably close. They appreciated each other instinctively and fully. Possibly the best of all insights into Pitsagi's professional approach is expressed in Garam's short contribution, Some Notes on Tritagi's Method of Working, in the Tritagi Anniversary Volume, of which he was one of the editors. Perhaps a prime reason for their mutual appreciation and esteem was that both were, first and foremost, engineers, although with remarkable scientific aptitude and curiosity. The Tritagi Library at NGI 
stands as a monument not only to Tritsagi's, to Bjorn's appreciation of Tritsagi's place in the history of civil engineering, but also to the close personal relation that prompted Tritsagi to entrust his files and library to his enthusiastic young colleague. Bjorn and I were no more than co-workers in our field until the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska in 1964. By good fortune, he and I were appointed by the Corps of Engineers to a three-man consulting board on the landslides associated with the disaster. We found stimulation not only in the project, but in each other, and determined in the future to keep, if possible, at least one project in which we would be associated. And so, successively, we worked together on a coffer dam failure on the Ohio River, on the dikes of the Dead Sea Project, and on the James Bay Hydroelectric Development in Canada. We looked forward to and enjoyed many a long evening when these projects brought us together, discussing not only the projects, but many frontiers of our knowledge, secondary consolidation, screen energy, diagenetic bonds, liquefaction. He was the innovator, the proposer. I was the objector, the conservative. Each of us pressed his view, and in defending his view, possibly brought the discussion closer to reality. During our last meeting in Montreal on the James Bay Project, Garam had bought tickets to a piano concert. It was held on the same stage, in the same hall, where he had accepted the presidency of our society, and we recalled many of the present incidents of that conference. Little did we realize that it would be our last time together. Like Tertsagi, he was a fighter for progress, for freedom in our society, for his institute. He was indeed irrepressible. Many of you will remember the closing banquet at the Mexico conference, the unexpectedly huge crowd, the deluge, the roving orchestras, each creating more decibels than the other. It was at this banquet that Lawrence had planned to introduce me with appropriate remarks as the new president. When the time came, he started a speech. But the roving orchestras were not aware of the ceremonies, and the attending guests could hear only the music. Nevertheless, Durham was determined to continue his speech, and continue it he did. Although I sat close by, I heard it not, and never learned what he said until I read the written version in the published proceedings. Characteristically, he fought against the odds. Once more, the slides. Here we see Bjorn with several others from NGI. You'll probably recognize uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ida and I think Bjorn Charnsley during the Swiss conference, helping a farmer move his handcart, and it got stuck. This is on the tour of the Swiss conference between the first and the last group of sessions. And the next slide shows him with Skempton on the same tour. In the next one, we see Lauritz and his wife Gudrun in the Laurentian Mountains to see the fall colors during the weekend of the Montreal Conference in 1965, where he was elected president of our society. And finally, one more slide with Gudrun at the airport in Haifa in Israel in 1966, ready to fly to Tel Aviv after a meeting on the Dead Sea Project. And once more, the lights, please. Seldom has a new profession been so fortunate as to develop under the leadership of four such men, all devoted to the advancement of their field, all master contributors to its growth, all influential far beyond their own localities, and all the most congenial and respectful of friends. Even outsiders note and remark on the family relationship among workers in soil mechanics the world over. This conference, the Ninth Family Reunion, testifies to the enduring influence of our first four presidents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peck, for your...
fascinating and enlightening lecture, which indeed gave a vivid life to the impressive technical contributions of our great masters, whom we didn't know en well enough. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll adjourn for a short recess until 10.30, when the main session number four starts. Thank you. <laughs>